40 years ago, tragedy struck at the Welsh mining village of Abavan. A mountain of coal slurry engulfed a school filled with small children. They were just wiped out in one go, one strike. In a matter of seconds, a generation died. I shouted at my mates, run! And I just ran like hell, just thought I was going to be killed. Like. Images of Abba Van's terrible plight were seen around the world. Eyewitness reports have described the scene... Mothers who were frantically clawing at whatever with their bare hands. The story of Abba Van that has been handed down through the decades has been of a terrible accident visited upon an unsuspecting community and of the government's failure to punish those responsible. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But driven by grief, anger, and guilt, the village fought for justice. What happened next taught the government a lesson and awoke in the people a sense of their own power. I was a lot younger, quite hot-blooded, and didn't like no for an answer. Is it what it wants? What is it? This is the untold story of Abba Van. It is October the 20th, 1966, in the Welsh mining village of Abavan. It has been raining heavily for two days, but the local children don't mind. Tomorrow is the last day before the half-term holidays. Eight-year-old Paul Davis is a pupil at Pantlas Junior School. Hello there. Well, if you think at his house that evening, everything seems normal. Paul is busy with his crayons and colored pens. His mother is watching television. She views his childish scribbling with only half an eye. In days to come, she would have good reason to see his drawing in a whole new light. Bernard Thomas counted Paul Davis as a friend. The following morning, as usual, Bernard and his mates made their way here. Today, it is a memorial garden on the edge of the village. Back then, it was Pantlas Junior School. Where now there are trees, wide borders, and birdsong, there were once desks, a playground, and the sound of children's laughter. That particular Friday, we were due to break up for the half-term holidays. We'd have a week off. Bernard had met his friends on the way to school, little knowing the nightmare that lay ahead. I didn't realise at that particular time that it would be the last time I'd see most of them alive. We had the assembly, morning assembly, into the classrooms to start going about the daily routine. Also at her desk as the school day began was eight-year-old Gaynor Madgwick. We chatted to our friends, um, just, a, just a happy sort of um, feel to um, breaking up for that day. The children in the rear classrooms had a view straight up the mountain. The skyline was dominated by seven enormous piles of coal waste. Each day the village's children took their lessons in the shadow of these tips. Between the waste tips and the school lay the steep banks of a canal and railway, by then disused, but still carrying the Merthyr to Cardiff water main. As a 14-year-old, Howard Rees attended Pantlas Senior School. Their day started half an hour later, and so at nine o'clock he was just setting off. I've left my home for school. Drizzly, miserable day. Walked up the hill towards the school. Howard was due to meet three friends, two of them teammates of his in the school's successful football team. A row of houses separated the junior and senior schools, and on a wall outside these sat his mates. 
By 9.15, there were 240 bright-eyed juniors sat at their desks. Hundreds of feet above them, tip number seven started to slide. Through the window at the back of his class, Bernard could see what was headed their way. I looked up the same direction to the window. I see the tallest ravi coming towards the school. I thought, oh, that was stop outside. But Howard Reese knew that the slurry was not going to stop. And approaching the corner of Moy Road, he could see that his three mates were in its direct path. I shouted my mates, run! And I just ran like hell in front of the senior school. I just thought I was going to be killed. Like. The windows and the walls at the back of the school were breached by the slurry. It's just a terrible, terrible rumbling sound. It was like thunder, but a thousand, thousand times louder than that. Tip number seven had collapsed, sending thousands of tons of foul coal waste crashing onto the junior school below. Standing today in what was then his classroom, Bernard recalls how the wave of slurry engulfed the room, picking him up and carrying him along. Slurry hit the, 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 the outer wall of the school, started engulfing the room, and I was literally just lifted up and transported with this stuff from over, over this area to over here. The school was struck by the landslide just after morning prayers. The children should have begun their half-term holiday this afternoon. Among the first on the scene was local colliery worker Enos Sims. The mothers were frantically clawing at whatever with their bare hands. Literally with their bare hands. A lot of them had only just left their children into the school. And as mothers do, they congregate after another chat. So they were actually on site as it happened. The word went out. The children were in mortal peril. Volunteers streamed in, desperate to do what they could. In a short space of time, literally thousands, I would say, milling around in, in the general area. Eyewitness reports have described the scene as resembling an earthquake or the aftermath of a high explosive bomb. One teacher said she heard a big rumbling sound and shouted to the children to get under their desks. Split seconds later, the classroom walls cracked and collapsed. Sitting at her desk, eight-year-old Gaynor Madgwick had been knocked unconscious by the force of the slide. I woke up at the corner of the classroom at the back, so I must have been pushed right up to the back. There was um, a radiator which had fallen off the wall, which had broke my legs. Couldn't feel my legs and couldn't see my legs either, and I, I started crying then. The school was there. That's all you could see was the rooftop of it. All the houses were covered. The school was buried in, more or less. Howard had seen his mates disappear under the black tidal wave. He returned to try and find them. You just try to remember where they were. And roughly about where this lake is here. When I eventually got back to the spot where they were, it was just to give me the runs, uh, you know. But it was too late. It had gone. At quarter past nine, some of the people who lived in the houses over there said that they heard a noise like an aircraft crashing. The tree went right through the school. One woman who saw three little boys sitting on the school wall. They hadn't gone into school. A moment later, they disappeared and they have been seen since. The row of houses between the junior and senior schools had been swept away, and with it, Howard's friends. In that same terrace lived 25-year-old miner from Merthyr Vale Colliery, Gerald Tarr. He had worked the previous night and had been in bed asleep when the disaster struck. Come on, boy. I had a big dog, Buster his name was. He bounded upstairs that morning, 
crashed into the bedroom. His shoes were sticking up in the air, like if there was something wrong, he knew there was something wrong. So as I went to talk to the dog, the ceiling cracked open, the bedroom wall behind me, come down and tumbled on top of me, crushing me into the bed. I worked on the ground for 13 years, so I knew where he was buried, like, you know, I knew where he was under it, like. Confronted with the scale of the tragedy, reporters were at a loss what to ask. I had intended to go along and talk to some of the parents there. But how can you look at a minor with tears streaming down his eyes as he digs away with his bare hands and you say, are you here for a personal reason? And he says, by God I am, son, I've got three boys down here. Still stuck with most of her classmates was Gaina Madwig. The, the wall had opened behind me. There was a child's arm from the elbow hanging through from the, the other classroom into my classroom, but the arm was sort of hanging where my shoulder was. And I remember hanging on to this hand and pinching the hand to see if it was the person was alive, the child was alive. But obviously there was no reactions. I managed to sit up. There was nothing actually trapping me, so I sat up and I looked, looked around and saw my teacher. Bernard's teacher helped him through one of the classroom's high windows and out into the corridor. And then to one of the main windows of the, the hall on the side of the room which had been opened. It had been opened up and out to the window sill and down. Bernard was one of the lucky ones, but the death toll was rising by the minute. Pictures of Abavan's desperate plight flickered in front rooms across the land. How many bodies have you brought up? To the time I came up, which was roughly uh, 15 minutes ago, there were 21, but I'm sorry to say there's still about 110 or 115 or even a few more who still have to be got out, and this is going to take quite a time. Abavan became Britain's first televised disaster. Rescuers finally freed Gaynor from beneath the radiator. I remember my leg was just like if it didn't belong to me. It was just all twisted and it was just basically hanging. But then it was like a chain. I had to be handed um, through the window to someone else. At eight years of age, you, you can't comprehend the enormous chaos I was in that one room alone. Lying in the wreckage of his house, Gerald Tower was pinned beneath a door. It left me a little bit of room to breathe. Of course, the air was the air was running out, like the oxygen was running out, and uh, I knew I was dying because my, start, my tongue started to swell, my lips started to swell, my throat was going dry, and I knew that uh, the oxygen was going out. I, I was uh, more or less on my bike like that. At once, Gerald Tarr became aware of a voice above him. I could hear him on top of me, shouting, I think it's somebody under here, and of course I was, I was screaming. I was screaming my head off. I thought, well, why can't he hear me, you know? I didn't have no air. I didn't have no air in my lungs, sort of thing, so he couldn't hear me. Gerald's desperate cries were eventually heard. But on its way down the mountain, the deadly slide had smashed over the canal bank behind the school. In doing so, it had fractured the Merthyr to Cardiff water main. The pipe burst, and I could hear the other fireman shout him, if you don't get him out now, he's going to drown. So, of course, I was, uh, I was going a bit mental then. I was trying to dig myself out from under the door with my one hand. And uh, I was just taking the nails off my fingers, trying to get under, from under this door, you know. Before the torrent could reach him, Gerald was freed with heavy lifting gear. His injuries were to keep him in hospital for many weeks. By now, everyone who could be there was there. One parent who could not was Cledwin Davis. He was at home recovering from a serious illness. He had two boys at Pantlas Junior. I knew there was something pretty serious when my 
um, you know that I lost a young lad. Well, the other lad who was in school, younger, when he came up the road towards the house, and I saw him coming, and he was covered in a black, messy slurry, but he'd managed to get out of the school. Claire's oldest son, Gareth, was among those who had not got out. What had begun as a rescue effort was now just an exercise in retrieving the dead. Never in my life have I ever seen anything like this. I hope that I shall never ever see anything like it again. This is one of many valleys in South Wales, in the South Wales coal field tonight. It's a very special valley. It's a valley that contains death. To go through that, like, uh, I'd have gone through it a thousand times if I could save a few kids, like, to be honest with you. There's nothing worse than losing a child, like. You know, you lose your house, bricks and mortar, you can, you can a place bricks and mortar or furniture you can put back. You, you can't put a child back, can you? You know. This is only a map of the village surrounding the, the area of Plant Glass Junior School all of which suffered fatalities, of course. The school was here, and the tips would have been up in this sort of area. The mining communities of South Wales lived with death, but this time the pit had come to claim the miners' children. A mass funeral took place days later. It wasn't just that the victims were so young. The roll call of the dead showed fatalities in almost every street. Roughly three to five there. My street, but five from the next street. Three from the, from the front. Three from Park Glass Road. Ten from Moy Road. Abraham Road, approximately seven. Two from Barrington Street. One from Irwin Street, one or two from McIntosh Street, there's two from Angus Street, Cotter Street, which leads off Angus Street, who were approximately eight. There was any streets that weren't affected in some way or other, so sort of one or two losses. The world wept with Abavan as it buried a generation of its children. In all, 116 children and 28 adults perished in the black slurry of Abavan. Among the coffins lowered into the earth had been that of eight-year-old Paul Davis. Weeks later, his mother was going through a drawer in their home in Upper Van. She came across the drawing that her son had been doing the night before the disaster that claimed his life. She saw in his scribbles a warning that the village was in peril. echoed talk locally. For years, residents said the coal board had been warned about tip number seven.
With its pit complex and its waste tips, Aberfan was a Welsh mining village like many others. The place only existed because of the mine. The coal board were more than employers, and the man at the top, Lord Robins, was more than a boss. But, recalls his wife, Lady Eva Robins, now in her 90s, he truly appreciated what the miners did. Oh, we loved the miners. They say, my God, those amazing men. What they put up with down there, God alone knows. And he said every piece of coal used today has got at the expense of one of those men. Oh, yes, he was committed to the miners. The feeling was mutual. Coal was a nationalized but dying industry, being overtaken by oil and nuclear power. Robins, a former top labor politician, was leading the fight against the government's closure program, which threatened every pit in the land. He and Lady Robins flew down to Abervan the day after the disaster. The atmosphere, it was calamitous. It was the most tragic feeling in the world. There was nobody literally talking to anybody. Alfred was whisked away. Lord Robins inspected the site. What had caused tip number seven to fail? Quickly, an answer emerged. Water. When the slurry is dry, it's a fine black powder. It's made of coal and of shale, the waste products of the industry. But when it gets wet, then the slurry changes into a thick black mud with the consistency of molten chocolate. There had been a natural spring in the center of the tip and the wetter the tip got, the less stable it became. On that day, the slurry reached saturation point. The tip collapsed. But was anybody to blame? In Abervan, Lord Robins was cornered by the press. Should you have a vote? Lord Robins. Take the slide. Can I ask you a few questions? Does the coal board have any responsibility for this slide happening? I would not myself have thought that anyone would know that there was a spring deep in the heart of the mountain, any more than I could tell you that there is one under our feet where we are now. But if you are asking if my people on the spot knew that there was spring water, then the answer is no, they could not possibly know. But was it possible to know that it was dangerous, sir? It was impossible to know that there was a spring at the heart of the tip turning the center of the mountain into slush. News of what Lord Robins had said spread around Abervan. The villagers thought they detected the whiff of whitewash. Because the existence of the spring was common knowledge. Prime Minister Harold Wilson had gone straight to Abervan on the day of the disaster. He had earlier issued a remarkable order to his Minister for Power, Richard Marsh. Wilson had said, you've got my authority to authorise anything that you want. Forget the cost, forget the protocol, tell them they can do it, whatever it is. The Labour governments of the time had their foundations in places like Abervan. The miners were their people. Villagers who encountered Wilson on his visit say he saw the tips towering over the village and declared, those must go. Wilson had returned to Chequers at 2.30 the following morning. He had apparently been deeply moved by what he had seen. He later wrote describing the murderous muck that still covered his shoes. It was, he said, several weeks before he could bring himself to clean them, and longer still before he could wear them. The villagers felt promises had been made. Helping Abervan in its hour of need was an absolute priority. But as far as many in the village are concerned, 
the story of Abavan is a story of promises broken. In the village, grief had turned to anger. The bereaved wanted two things. They wanted the remaining tips gone, and they wanted to know why their children had died. A tribunal of inquiry was set up in Merthyr Tydfil, six miles away. The evidence to be heard by a three-man panel. This was Abavan against the mighty National Coal Board. Many in the village anticipated a cover-up, and indeed the board's attitude was obstructive from the off. Their council contested everything. Uh, my lord, it is not 